Well, good morning, everybody. It's been a while since I've uh, shared anything with you. Um, I thought I'd share a little bit about Chapter 6, Section 1, uh, concerning momentum. And momentum is defined as simply mass times velocity. So you double the mass, you double the momentum, you double the velocity, you double the momentum, and so on. The SI units for momentum is kilograms times meters divided by seconds. So it's a kilogram meter per second. Uh, as we talked about before, if you take a scalar times a vector, you end up with a vector. So momentum is a vector quantity. And momentum can be related to kinetic energy. If we look at this equation right here, kinetic energy equals momentum squared divided by 2 times mass. That's the equation relating kinetic energy to momentum. And we'll see that we end up with the correct units because... Um, if we take and write momentum out, we end up with mass squared times velocity squared, and then we divide by mass, and we end up with one half mv squared, which is kinetic energy. Then, a concept very closely related to momentum is impulse, because impulse, the impulse you impart on an object will change the object's momentum. So here we'll relate um, force equals change momentum divided by time. And again, if we look at our equation um, a little bit more closely, we have mass times velocity is momentum divided by time. Velocity is distance divided by time. So now we have mass times distance divided by time divided by time which gives us mass times distance divided by time squared. And this right here is acceleration. So we end up with Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. So change momentum would equal force times time. And force times time is given the name impulse and the algebraic term for that is capital I. So we have impulse equals force times time, which will equal the change in momentum that an object will experience. So if you increase force, you'll increase change momentum. If you increase time, you'll increase change momentum. So if we take an example in sports, when hitting a baseball, a golf ball, a tennis ball, etc. The ball deforms around the bat, the racket deforms, the tennis ball deforms, etc. Those deformations allow the time of impact to increase. So the force of impact is staying the same. Well, actually, the force of impact is the same whether this time increases or not. But during the collision between the bat and the ball, you start out with zero force and then it rises to maximum force and then it decreases back to zero force as the baseball leaves the bat. But because the baseball deforms, it actually wraps around the bat, um, it increases the time of the collision. And so you get a much bigger change in momentum and the baseball, the golf ball, the tennis ball, et cetera, will leave with a much greater velocity. Now, in an accident, the change in momentum is the same whether the object is stopped over a long period of time or a short period of time. So this is assuming collision leads to a stop. Uh, so we're not talking about uh, bouncing. Uh, that's a little bit different story. But if the object comes to a stop, its change momentum is whatever its initial momentum was minus zero because its final momentum is zero because it stopped. So it doesn't matter how it stops. You have the same change momentum. So now when we look at our equation up here, uh, where do I have it? Oh, I have to go way up. When we look at our equation, Here we go. 
when we look at our equation, the uh, change in momentum is the same when the object collides with something else and comes to a stop. So if we can increase the time, force will become very small. And this is exactly what they're doing uh, with cars to make them safer is one thing they've created crumple zones. So when a car gets in an accident, the car crumples. And as it crumples, it increases the time of impact. Therefore, the force of impact decreases. It's the same thing with the airbag. The steering wheel or the dashboard would stop you in much less time than the airbag does. So the airbag increases the time that the person is stopped and that decreases the force of impact. Same thing when a pole vaulter goes over the bar, they're gonna come down and land in the pit. If they land on the ground or they land in the pit, the change of momentum is the same. But the pit increases the time of contacts, therefore the force of impact is decreased as the pole vaulter lands safely into the foam pit. So all those ideas, the momentum, change of momentum is the same, but the car industry, the pole vault pits, et cetera, are all designed to increase time, thereby decreasing force of impact. Okay, so a typical collision, um, a golf club hitting a golf ball. When the golf club first makes impact with the golf ball, there's zero force right the instant it's making contact. And then as the ball is hit and deforms, the force of impact increases until it reaches a maximum. And then the ball um, starts to leave the club and go back to its original shape. And then the force between the club and the golf ball decreases till it gets here. And so in reality, this is with almost all collisions, this is the type of graph shape you'll see. And it can change a little bit uh, being steeper on one side and not as steep on the other side, et cetera. But uh, when we're doing our problem, what we're always doing is we're taking the average force times the time of impact. These two lines were wrong. So we're looking at this rectangle here. And the area under that rectangle taking the average force would be the same as the area under this bell curve. So in our problems, we're simplifying, simplifying it down to where we're taking the average force times the time. So let's look at a couple example problems here. First, let's look at example problem 6.1. And in this case, we have a golf ball that has a mass of 0.5 kilograms. Its initial velocity sitting on the T is zero meters per second. When it leaves the golf club, it will leave with a velocity of 44 meters per second. So the question is, is to figure out what uh, the impulse is on the golf ball. And change momentum equals mass times change in velocity. Change in momentum also equals impulse. So we can go impulse equals mass times change in velocity. And so that's written right here. So we have mass 0 0.05 times 44 minus zero, and that gives us 2.2 Newton seconds, which I suppose technically is the units for impulse, but a Newton second is the same as a kilogram times meters per second. Newton is kilogram meters per second squared. The seconds here cancels the squared in the denominator and we end up with just meters per second. The second part is we were asked to estimate the time of the collision. And it told us that the golf ball is going to be in contact with the golf club for 0 0.02 meters. And so we can take time equals distance divided by average velocity. The distance is 0 0.02, and the average velocity would be 22 meters per second. And so then we end up with 9.1 times 10 to the negative fourth seconds. Well, then to find the force of impact, 
we take change momentum divided by time and we end up with 2,420 newtons. Sample problem two, page 174, what we have here is a car that collides with a brick wall and then it bounces. And so here we come in with the idea of bouncing. And when you have something that bounces off of a surface, you have a much greater change in momentum because it doesn't go from its initial velocity 15 to zero, it goes from 15, negative 15 meters per second to 2.6 meters per second. So the total change in momentum is 17.6 meters per second. And it says this collision takes place over 0.15 seconds. So A, we're supposed to find the impulse, and impulse equals change momentum. So it's the mass of the car times the change in velocity. So the mass of the car is 1,500 kilograms. The final velocity is 2.6 meters per second minus the initial velocity of a negative 15 meters per second. So we end up with 1,500 kilograms times 17.6 meters per second, and we end up with 26,400 kilogram meters per second for our impulse. Now, relating that to, um, to the average force of impact, um, again, force of impact equals change in momentum divided by time. So we take the number we just calculated divided by 0.15 and we end up with 1,000, excuse me, 176,000 newtons. Bouncing is bad. And so in a collision, you want to just come to a stop. That's much safer than if you hit something and then bounce off of it. Uh, to give you another example of this, say, um, like you're watching a football game and a quarterback gets tackled and as he's falling on his back, his head, his head hits the turf and then bounces off the turf. That's bad. And that generally leads to a concussion. And so if you're falling down and your head hits the ground, it's much better to land on grassy soil where your head pretty much just comes to a stop than it is to bounce off the turf even if the time of impact was the same. Now, when your head lands on the grass, it has, has the added benefit besides reducing the bouncing, it also increases the time of impact. So both of those things reduce the um, force of impact, which is better on the brain, obviously. And so you, you don't end up with a concussion. Um, so that's what I have for chapter six. Section one.